back on the air. Here we go one more time, guys. We uh, we appreciate you listening in uh, last week, and we're going to continue the train forward with show number seven. I am the handler of uh, the one and only chronic Chris Page. Could not do this program without my tag team partners. First, uh, the man representing TIA Promotions. Uh, also doing some stuff with the World Series of Wrestling, uh, though you, we call him the Sauce Boss. Uh, you may know him as Tim Applesauce. What's going on, brother? How's it going? Yes, good. Good evening on, on a beautiful Sunday night. Uh, I'm ready for another show. We got a good show here, and I've got a lot that I want to talk about, and uh, it's uh, I'm ready to get to it. It's so, going to be, uh, we're, we've got some good shit on deck uh, before we move forward and, and get our other tag partner in on this. Uh, did you get any feedback on uh, last week's Super Show uh, podcast? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously I'm running a Super Show right now, so a, a lot of folks um, have a lot of experience with, with the stuff that we're talking about. So the engagement seems to be really really up right now people are really energized uh people are listening to the shows uh and um you know it's all linked together so i think the 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 more content that we create like this uh that's for the entire hobby is is good and uh and hopefully i can contribute to that so well you certainly are by by tagging in here and doing this program with us and by us i would definitely be referring to uh, the man who I uh, usually go over the top with. And, uh, yeah, I'm just going to have to do it again. The glorious Mandingo Man Beast. Jonathan Cable. What's up, man? Oh, we're here yet again on another fabulous Ring Bell Radio, ready for another episode to hit the books in glorious fashion. Yes, sir. Uh, listen, I'll I, get your take on this first. Uh, Last week's episode was one of the most downloaded episodes on Anchor and Spotify for us as far as Ringbell Radio is concerned. Uh, shout out to all those that uh, are listening on that platform, and if you're not, you should. Uh, the link's in the description. Like, subscribe, all that good shit. Comment. Uh, for all of you out there that are listening, uh, you should know that the uh, the Anchor Spotify page gets the content <laughs> first, uh, so you'll get you'll catch all shows early there. Um, I thought last week's show was was really spot on, uh, especially because right now we're in the midst of three super shows being produced at literally at one time, uh, drop in sporadically uh, over the next month or so. So, John, what kind of feedback did you get from uh, from last week's show? Uh, I didn't get any personal feedback, but I did notice that a lot of the the news groups, the guys that repost news like Denzel and um, and Big Ticket and stuff like that, there was a lot of reposting of the show. Uh, so I like that. I like the fact that we've got good interactions on Twitter with the with the news feeds, uh, and that people are actually looking at the show and and contemplating what we're talking about. I'm I'm glad that it's helpful, and I'm glad that we get information out there that other people find also helpful. Yeah, no doubt. Um, before we jump into uh, to show seven's topic, uh, we're going to introduce a new segment of the program while we're in the midst of the World Series of Wrestling, which if you don't know, uh, you shame on you. Uh, it's going till the end of the year, and I mean, I can't see how you wouldn't know if you're on Twitter. And, uh, if they don't know already, then they're not watching AEW or WWE because both of them are railing Mr. Sauce's product. <laughs> well, we are going to do the a, a, a recap, basically, of uh, the week's events with the World Series of Wrestling. Why not? Because Sauce Boss is, uh, is on top of that and control, not necessarily controlling, it's the wrong word to use, but uh, is in charge of that, that, little, that little piece of, uh, of the Super Show uh, uh, pie. So let's get some recaps, Boss. What's going on? Well, we are in the thick of it right now. So this is... Uh, I, we've been running the show for, I think, ten weeks of of preseason, and uh, now we're in the third uh, event at this point. So, event one uh, was was judged, and results were released live on Thursday night. And event one for for those who haven't been following, we called it Bio Royale, and it was basically a profile competition, right? First time anybody joins a Fed, the first thing they do is they create a profile. They're looking to, you know, introduce themselves, catch a lot of attention. If you can't do that, you're gonna have a hard time getting over, getting a push. So that's what we said. Let's, you know, let's see your best, your best first impression. And 
we we had three judges score the event. It was myself. It was Denzel Porter, who you may have heard of, no. and Larry Larry Tech, who if if you don't know Larry, he's honestly one of the the best guys in the game. And his his character is a scoundrel, but just a superior human being. He's he's a good guy. So he's doing uh, he's doing the work of the wrestling gods by helping me judge these events and the results if uh, if you don't mind i'll run through the top 10 sure and give a little bit of shine to the folks who participated and and put out a great product uh we had four people had perfect scores that means all three judges gave them perfect scores and we uh, in an attempt to avoid getting any death threats we kept the judges anonymous uh, but we did post all the scores for everybody. So those four perfect scores were the comedian Alan Chaney, the mechanic Peter Vaughn, uh, the golden lion Rayon Keto, and or is it Ryan? I think Ryan. I get that wrong every day. Ryan Keto, uh, and Vodka Black, who I don't think she has a moniker, but most likely you know her name. Vodka with an H. Uh, then uh, in the next tier we had the guys who missed it by a point and that was The Beast, John Cable uh, Lex Collins and Paul Montori and then in the next tier the folks that missed it by two points we had Casanova English Molly Hatchett, Regan Voorhees Steven Strafford and Zara Ivory so very nice profiles but each one of them they all received perfect scores from at least one judge uh but for for one reason or another they couldn't please all of us so uh it was I, it was I, really fun to see what everybody put out i have a story so okay uh, my story rests with uh, uh the day after your live stream for results of course uh, john knows that i'm i'm old man i'm in the bed nine o'clock usually on a school night as i call my work nights uh, I wake up, I come in, check my computer, and I get I have DMs from John, uh, telling me all about how he placed and just how excited he was. And, and my response to him was, "Good job, buddy. I'm proud of you." Uh, so I, you know, it's invigorated him to to come into this event and place uh, uh, where he placed. Uh, and how yeah, playing. I got a minus one point was a was a pleasant surprise. I was a little freaking out, but I was happy about my placement. I was actually really happy with everyone's performance. The top half of the of the competitors, there was only an eight point spread from perfectly flawless to the thirty second spot. So to have that many people in an eight point spread is impressive. Like, no one should look down on their performance or be sad about how they did. Everyone pulled out really good work, and it was a good performance by all involved. I was very impressed with the field, and I hope that everybody was also very impressed with their own work and proud of the effort that they put in. Well, I was about to say that top ten, uh, I mean, that's a, that's a who's who. Yeah. But it was only a two-point spread in the top ten. Sure. Sure. Uh, so – Let's see. The engagement for the event was really great on the live stream. We had, I think, up to 20 viewers on the live stream at one time. Uh, so that was really great. People were, you know, the chat was just going off. I couldn't keep up with, with the chat that was there. And everybody seemed, you know, anxious, excited, uh, happy. Some people were disappointed, but I think by the end of it. Absolutely uh, terrified, you know, some of us. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was cool. It was like the feelings were tangible there. It was. That was a unique experience uh, for e-fetting. Um, and then I just rolled right from those results into event two, three, and four and set up everything up until we do the cuts. So event two is a 750 word, just open freestyle, basically an audition tape to get on the show. Mm. You know, And people turned that in. Last night was the due date on that. So we've got, we had 50 people uh, turn up for event one we had 44 people turn up for event two and uh, you know you expect some diminishing returns on participation which is which is okay um and then event three i think we're going to keep everybody uh, event three is twitter interactions and then event four will be the 1500 words shoot promo 
So I think everybody who made it this far is, is going to stick through till the cut. And if you are listening to this show and you're in that event, uh, do your writing now. Get it out of the way. You know, don't wait till the last minute. Um, you know, you can turn in this show now. You can turn in the Terra Phoenix Cruise event writing now. Uh, you can turn in your submissions for the V Strader event now. Just knock it out. Knock it out. Don't procrastinate. So that that's where we are right now on the show. I think results for event two will probably be out next Sunday. And then we'll update the standings and we'll see who's still perfect at that point. Uh, I don't know if anybody's going to stay perfect all the way through, but it would be cool to see. Well, shout out to everybody well, out there that's taking part in this because it's it's turning into a pretty big pretty big soiree. Uh, it, that's the plan. I mean, that's what we're hoping. Uh, it, I I have a good feeling that within the next year you're going to see an event from AEW or WWE called the World Series of Wrestling, and then you can go, oh, I was in that. Um, yeah. Of course, they'll do. They may do it a little bit better than I do, but uh, uh, I think th- I think our finger is on the pulse of wrestling right now, and they're watching. They they've got writers who are watching what we're doing, and if they're not, they should be because honestly, th- you could use some original ideas. No, the they program. they are factually watching what we're doing. They've yeah. absolutely done the golden ticket at AEW, and now they're yeah. promoting a WWE. This is awesome show. They are yeah. absolutely watching what we're doing, and they are absolutely straining our ideas into their company. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think now may be a good time to transition into our topic for the night, and uh, this is something that I brought up. This is this is a, a, uh, a hill that I would die on, and that's just championships. Uh, you know, all about championships. What do they represent? Um, you know, they seem to be the driving force in e fetting. So, you know, let's just let's talk about it and get to the bottom of what it is about them that is so uh, enticing for people to get into this hobby. Uh, so, what do you think, Chris? I'm all for it, man. I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm ready to dive in and, and give my perspectives on it. Uh, and I know that John sure as shit's ready to jump in and give his perspectives on it. So uh, let's rock and roll. Let's 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 make it happen. So what is a championship in wrestling? Realistically, it's a hunk of metal on a leather strap but it's way more than the component parts of the materials that make it. It's a legacy. It's a historical document. It's a moment that you can hold in your hands and show that you're the best of a group of people. Championships are always to be earned, period. Earning them is the goal of wrestlers. If we are not striving to earn championships, we are not striving to become better, period. No, I like it. I like it. Um, I mean, that's a good foundational point uh, to start the conversation off with. So, uh, Applesauce, uh, your, your topic, man. You steer the show. Well, the, the old quote that I always go back to is, you know, re- wrestling is pro wrestling is a funny thing because... It's a bunch of man, a bunch of men, fighting with no pants on over a belt, and uh, it doesn't make any sense. But it's not supposed to. It's supposed to be escapism, right? Um, if you look back in history at the, you know, the champion of your military force, he was the person you could put out front. And if you've ever seen the movie Troy, there's there's a scene in Troy where. Uh, Achilles goes out and it's a 1v1 battle for the war and whoever wins that battle saves the lives of of everybody on both sides that that are not in that championship fight so and historically Boagrius had defeated many many armies in one-on-one combat and they had taken many conflicts without any loss of life minus the champions on the opposite sides and Boagrius was by far the favorite in that contest. Look at this so guy your coming, champion coming out of nowhere with uh, oh yeah with that. 
Right. So it, that's exactly what what I'm getting at is that your champion is chosen by uh, chosen by your leader as the most qualified fighter and represents the entire army and fights on behalf of those who can't fight. He represents those who have no voice. And that's what you have in wrestling is that your champion represents your company. It represents those who may not have the platform or or the push or the reach that your champion does. And your champion reflects the quality of your organization. And I think that remains true for real life wrestling and for e-fetting as well. Absolutely. The the first thing a real wrestler, like a real company looking to put titles on a worker looks at is how well they engage the fans, how well they sell tickets, how involved are they in the angle that they're running, and how well do they follow what you tell them to do. Writers have a job in the industry to make a good story. And while they take information from the workers, they're still writing in the office. And the people that are writing these angles and the, the creative staff have a lot of tools at their advantage to really look at and network with the fans to find out what they want to see and what they want to do and what they would cheer for and what they would boo. And the real workers that can get those emotional, illicit responses from the fans are the ones that companies want to put titles on for one reason or another. There's a lot of reasons for it. But you have to be able to get into the fans and make them invested in you as a worker to earn a title that way. For sure. Um, I think on the EFED side of the coin, um, you know, championships have different meanings for different people. Um, and as a as a Fed, when you're putting your, I mean, I can talk about the WGWF because we're in the process of doing this right now is building the the divisions and and building the championships and and as far as what do do titles mean first and foremost on the game side uh, real life side john you're 100 percent correct to see it that that's just you know, we're both industry people so it's not we we kind of share that that mindset uh on the on the gaming side it's um you know it's about who who's the best of the best you know based on uh, you know, whichever championship criteria fits uh, fits what. Uh, John, you're like you're about to jump in. What you, what you got? I was just saying how I, <clears throat> being from both perspectives, I actually prefer the e set the e fed method of merit to achieve rather than the real life company's popularity to achieve. Uh, where in e fedding, you are really being judged on the merit of your work, and in the ring. The best wrestler may not ever win a championship. How many matches did you ever see Steven Richards win a belt in? But probably one of the best workers in the industry. Mm -hmm. Just from a pure talent perspective. Sure. Would he ever win the world title? No, because he would never have the popularity that he'd need to push the ticket sales like that. But from a worker's perspective, by far one of the best in the industry. Yeah, so that's kind of like the the MMA approach versus the sports entertainment approach, right? Where MMA is supposed to be 100% uh, uh, merit-based. It, it it That's not always the case. I mean, they do want to have headliners who are going to draw pay-per-view buys. But, I mean, you can earn a belt in the UFC by just by winning. In pro wrestling, it's more complicated than that. Um, in pro wrestling and and in e fetting, it's I guess angle feds are a lot more like pro wrestling is, where all the results are staged. And competitive RP feds are more like the MMA style. Um, you know, those belts. In in some cases, the belt elevates the fighter, like in UFC. Um, and in other cases, the wrestler makes the belt. It give, they give the belt credibility. So it, it can work one of two ways. I think the important part is to recognize at what at which point, uh, you know, what is the purpose of this championship? Because you can probably come up with examples where it's not doing anybody any good for this champion to hold this belt any longer. We have to get this belt off of this person 
because it's damaging the company and it's damaging the wrestler. Um, and then there are other situations where, and this is ideal, where both things are true, that the wrestler benefits and everybody benefits, you know, the, uh, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. That's the goal. Um, so how do you achieve that? And I think there are a bunch of little things that you can do with your divisions and with the number of belts you have, creating secondary titles and tag titles. Um, there are things that you can do to make it uh, to make it seem uh, just to give it more credibility is what I'm getting at. So Chris, what what are your thoughts on that? Well, my first initial thing where I was going a minute ago, you kind of hit the nail on the head. I'm a firm believer of the, the, the role player, the handler, makes the championship. Uh, the championship, you, I mean, it can make people, but when you've been in the game as long as I have, like a secondary championship I could make mean probably more than any world belt just because of the experience that I have with uh, – with with play in the game and play in the character because that's what it all kind of boils down to um i don't think that to me and again 20 plus years at this juncture in my game championships aren't as as relevant to to me or my character uh which is so counterproductive to john's stance and what john would want to do uh and because you john feels like you've got to if you're not going for a belt, then why are you here? Well, I'm here to continue laying my legacy down and uh, doing that by role-playing against some of the best of the best across uh, many different super shows and other uh, respective avenues out there. Um, but if I was to win a championship, and I've won several this year, uh, my, my whole process behind it was now that I've got it, what can I do to make it mean more? Uh, than it than it did when I when when I when I picked it up, um, and can I do that? You know, because there are some situations that are unwinnable, and you you know, you, it doesn't matter what you do with it. Um, it's all about how it's booked and and how important uh, the respective federation takes that particular uh, championship. Uh, I think that all belts can be prestigious uh, if you make them that way. And if you if you handle them that way, even if someone handles the belt prior to you like trash, you can make that trash and turn it into treasure real fucking quick if you know how to play and you know how to write and you know how to tell that story about that championship. You can turn it around super quick. And sometimes that is a challenge, uh, right? Like that's something that entices would entice me to like go after something. Oh, you guys think this is trash? Let me show you. Let me let me go ahead and get my hands on that motherfucker and uh and and just uh do some things with it and show you that this belt can not only mean something it can mean way more than you think it could uh and, and then you know go from there I think that um naturally you know as the competitive writers and and I wouldn't necessarily classify myself that at now I mean I do like to write and I do like to win obviously but uh, I'm not as competitive as most in the game right now but I can say that as a competitive writer like if you want to be the best the way to be there is to get a championship and it doesn't matter what belt it is because again I fall back on he who has the belt makes the belt like you can make the championship the championship doesn't make you um, I, I get it and I can see where you would definitely want to be in that conversation 24-7 John well, and that goes back to, like, what does a belt mean? And I think it means a lot of different things depending on what belt it is and where it came from and who held it and what the legacy of that championship is. Like, right now, if you look at EFEDs, the most prestigious world belt, and I'm loath to say it, is probably the X-Dub World Championship. Across the board, if you're going to hold a world belt, that's the one. And the fact that Ryan Kiddo and Flynn had that big war about it and Flynn won the Cannabis Cup and now he had the belt, has the belt currently, yeah. like that makes that belt very prestigious. If you could take that belt off of Mark Flynn right now, you're the man because he just won the Cannabis Cup. 
against all odds. He's making a name for himself as the champ in X-Dub. He's winning places other than the X-Dub. Everywhere he goes, the man's got a legacy, and he's dangerous. If you have that kind of respect in the industry and you hold a title somewhere, especially somewhere that's got the longevity that X-Dub has, you automatically are holding on to a relic that's not just some title. It's the title. And that doesn't mean that it's the only important one out there, but from a legacy standpoint, what else is there? Like, it's the premier belt. Other places are going to have to come up and fix that and make their titles mean as much as that one. And the only way to make titles mean something is to have storylines that readers are interested in, have competitors that are at the top tier of their ability, and have that be marketed across the entirety of the industry so that everyone can see it. And those are the things that the X-Dub does real well. If you want to go to a highly competitive Fed, there's only a handful of them out there, like realistically, that have the top echelon of writers consistently writing at their company. <clears throat> and that's what it takes to make a title important in e-fetting, is to have a string of people that are good at what they do consistently holding the value of that title over time. Yeah, I think you make a great point there, John. Um, and I think I agree with pretty much everything you just said. Uh, so let me ask you a hypothetical question. And I think you're the right person to ask this. Can you think of a situation where you would not want to win a championship? You get put into a match and you decide, you know what, it's probably best if I don't win this one. Um, I have been in several scenarios where I did not take a title and I've let titles go and I've, you know, like my two title runs at WGWF in the, in the former run literally lasted all of five minutes, both of them. <laughs> like I got the belt and then it got taken away from me. And then I worked my way back up over a month or two and got the belt again just to have it taken away from me in the company clothes. So, but in that case, you still won the belt. You still got your hands on it. I mean, uh, I did, I, but then it wasn't mine anymore. So my title reign literally lasted thirty seconds a pop. Well, that's thirty so seconds what good more is, than a lot of people have gotten. Yeah, but what good so, is that in the legacy but, of my championship runs? How does that make it any better? It doesn't. So, he, so here's why I asked the question: because as a as a rookie, I come in. I've never held a world championship before, and the you know there the mountain is there to climb you can see the top and at the top is that big shiny 10 pole 10 pounds of of leather and brass and you want to hold that thing more than anything you can taste it you see other people with it and you just you know you no i see other people looking at it right now and i want to smack them in the mouth for their <laughs> audacity sure yeah no it works both ways so in in my situation, there was an opportunity to earn your spot in a champ in the world championship match, right? There's you have a rumble, you have a gauntlet match, you have some type of tournament or qualifier. And as a rookie, I said, I don't want to even sniff that world title. It's oh yeah, I've soon. skipped. I've soon. skipped. Um, I've skipped battle royals and and prize matches where the prize was go for a world title shot. Uh, right. like multiple person matches because in the end of the day I know that I don't need to win that battle royale to get my shot at the belt if I can build an angle through the back door to make myself relevant enough to challenge me right but so, I do I right because right? I right. you know some geek off the street I just got <laughs> off the couch and I said hey uh, I can wrestle and they said well here here's a chance for you to, to you know get that match and I said hell no I don't want that because no, that's soon. realistic expectations. This, yeah, this is what that soon, is. Right? Yeah. So in, in that same company, we had somebody who started about the same time I did, and they rocketed to the top, and they ended up holding that belt for a while. And it really poisoned the chalice for them. They got the belt. They didn't feel like that they had earned it. Uh, they didn't know what to do with it. They They felt like other people resented them for you know, skipping ahead in line. Well, and my and advice to of... my advice to that whole perspective is if you didn't earn it, then you wouldn't have it. 
And if people think they're good enough to take it, then come get some. Yeah, like I mean, that's and that's where it is. So this other handler is is a good guy, right? And he holding that championship looks around and he sees other people who have served longer. They've they've had more wins under their belt, but the timing and you know things just didn't work out. It's that for rocket to, ship to remorse. Have, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it took a lot of the fun out of it for him to hold that belt because he didn't have to to scratch and claw his way into that match like everybody else does. So I think it can be detrimental for both the handler and the Fed if somebody who just steps into your Fed and inst- gets that instant shot. I think you have to be really careful about how you book that and how you sell it. I um, I um Here's my take on that. I, I, I like that. Um, I think there are those that who, who can be put in that position and handle it, and I think there are those that who cannot. Um, I think that's a position, you know, more warranted towards seasoned veterans to the game. And I don't get me wrong; I completely understand the perspective of you, you're here, you're talented, we're gonna give you a shot and see what happens. I I, I get that because that's that's part of the game. You want uh, newer people to your Fed to see that you don't have to be here for. Uh, months or, or you know. Well, not only that, but in in e fetting and in real wrestling, the, the industry is always looking for the next hot commodity. If you come out of the woodwork out of nowhere and nobody knows you, and you just start blowing people off the top of the charts, man, you're getting a shot because yeah. everybody wants to see the new hot thing. Also, as the on the handler side of that of that equation and of that co- of that coin is if you're not uh, prepared for that, don't feel like you have to do it. Because you don't. You can easily say, hey, I appreciate it, but let me try and do this and go about it from this different perspective. Because while I, you know, again, appreciate the that you that you think so much, but it's, you know, it's kind of my character and this is kind of what I want to do uh, until I get more comfortable. Now, that may change. That out, your, the, the handler outlook may change in three weeks four weeks after you have a couple of matches and you you start building a little bit of momentum you know okay now i can i'm I'm more comfortable with the with the idea of of well and i think i think that lends into the reason that there are tiered title systems like why we have the tiers of titles that we have and we haven't touched on that yet but i know it was something we definitely wanted to talk about i think here is a great place to put it in so why are there tier structures for titles well, obviously, there are tiered structures of talents. There's also different purposes for each of the titles. And I think a lot of people misunderstand what the original intent behind the real titles were that we model our title system from. And one of the things that I know we talked about earlier um, off camera was the TV title being often undervalued and underlooked for a major belt to hold. And I think most of that is because of the misconception that it's a low-tier title. And in reality, the TV title in the heyday of wrestling was more important than the world belt all day. You're because TV the TV champ the TV champ was on the show every time they fired those cameras up and you had a 15-minute match and it was always like early on in the card. It was a pace setter for the rest of the show. And to be the TV champ, they had to trust in, in, implicitly that you were going to be able to not only handle the workload, but the spotlight and look good for their company in the long run. And if you couldn't, you were a paper champ and a placeholder and somebody else came by and swept you off your feet in the next show. And they just dropped the belt wherever they wanted to until they found the right spot to build the show on. And I think that a lot of people underestimate the TV title as a lower tier belt when in reality it's the gatekeeper to the rest of the company if you don't get through the tv champ or if you don't hold the tv title how do you get to the mid belt or the world belt like that's a tier that you have to work through it isn't that saying the same thing though uh, we're saying it's a lower tier belt and you're saying it's a prerequisite to the world title or the or a secondary title like a intercontinental championship i'm saying that from a fedhead's perspective it should be a prerequisite because then you can be trusted to hold that kind of a position in a company and work the workload and not freak out 
from the from a, a noob perspective uh when you hear about tv titles or the internet championship or whatever kind of awful name impact has for that title uh it it always sounds like it's the rising star belt right like this person's holding the belt look out for them in the future because they are the future of the company they're holding this belt as uh that this is us uh, labeling them as a prospect, as as a phenom, as somebody who's going to be something someday, and we're, you know, we're gonna they're gonna hold the title for a little while, and then they're gonna they're gonna move up the card. Um, that's that's how I've always looked at it. But and I wish that everyone else shared that perspective because that's the way it should be looked at. That was the original right. intention of that title spot. But it is not necessarily looked at that way by the mass populace of wrestling fans and e-fetters. Or really even fed heads or companies in general. Like, look at the number of times that you've seen major companies on TV pushing their TV titles through a million people's hands that probably aren't worth it. Like, it's not always looked at. And, and again, that goes to what's your belt worth? How much legacy is built on it? What what realistic value do you have in holding it? And it's all in the respect that the title garnishes. I so look at now, my uh, I look at the you know the the TV championship. Uh, you know, I, I'll take it from my perspective. From my federation, it's not a lower tier belt. It it is a it it's to me it. Te- just like in real wrestling, if you're really utilizing it correctly, like it is the the one that's featured the most, uh, you know, with TV title defenses on programming and and what have you. And and I look at it as a way to <clears throat> push someone to carry a division. And I would do that with my Intercontinental and with my World Belt and with my Tag Belt. Seeing like I want you guys to show me why it means so much make it mean more uh and and it will get like i'm not a i'm one of those bookers i'm not opposed if if my story behind my my ic or my tv title is hotter than what's behind my world belt don't think for one second that an ic championship or a tv title match won't headline fucking pay-per-view don't don't think for i'm that guy like if you put the effort into the belt i'm well, you know what I mean? Like that's what the Dream of Maniacs tag title run was hotter than the world belt was at the time that we were doing it. Um, it was, and it wasn't by design. It nope. Was just, it, it was supposed to be a side angle for the tag titles, just to do a thing, and it turned into a far bigger, valuable championship than anything else that was going on at the time. But yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, but I didn't mean to step on you, Sauce Boss. I know you're about to pivot into another another question or another topic. Well, it, on the topic of TV titles and making them work and having them be equal, I think a, an important part of that is carving a niche for that title. What makes it unique to the other divisions in your company? And I believe with uh, the WGWF, it's the word limits, mm-hmm. right? So the TV title is, is a 1,000 words, and that is it how many 2000 2000 2000 so with the lower word count um some writers find it difficult to tell the story that they want in those low word counts especially the ones that are very descriptive writers like like john who who can't help but describe the chair in every room that's correct Um, every curtain and fold of cloth there are some writers who prefer just to get right to the meat and potatoes of of their RP and Page. they want to shoot hard right off the bat. And Page. for me personally, I prefer uh, very conversational RPs where, where it is a lot of shoot. I don't need all of the uh, description because I like to let my imagination kind of fill in the blanks. Um, so for me, that TV title is going to have a different style of writer, which I actually find more attractive. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish one division from another. And if you don't do that, then it does really look like a tiered system. Mm-hmm. Well, and the so, other thing that sets that belt apart uh, in most places is the the number of shows that you're booked on. 
The world title might not get booked in a match every month even. The TV title is going on every show. That's actually my driver to shoot for the belt as soon as someone puts it on the table because I want to go on every show just because I want the workload. Yeah, and that's that's a nice uh, – that's you can bait the hook with that uh, if you're running a Fed. Say, hey, come into my Fed. Uh, you can get a shot at a title pretty quickly. That TV title is defended every every card. Um, if if you're hungry for a title, you know we can get you in that mix. It's you, you know everybody gets a shot eventually. If you want that world title, you need to be patient and you need to put in the work. And it's not so easy because that that title is more difficult to attain just based on the number of opportunities that are given out. There aren't many. They're few and far between. So. When you hold it, it means a lot more. It's the workhorse, man. It's the workhorse belt um, reality, in, in in any or it should be in any Fed. It's your you guys. If you got your hands on that, then you're probably putting in more workload than than most anyone else on their roster with the defenses and or in segments and and all that other jazz. So there's a lot happening with that belt, and you know I think that it does you know kind of set the pace. If I like it should be a segue to talk about like a mid card championship, like an intercontinental or a United States champion or what have you. Like if I'm, if I'm that guy and I'm in that position and I see that, you know, this TV title scenes, you know, firing up, it, it's going to make me more motivated to find somebody to program with so that we can, uh, you know, save the integrity of, of, of this championship. Because if, and, and the, the, what's wild is we're not going to change perception perception is reality uh the tier system is how people view things even though you know whether i agree or disagree with it i don't view things as a tier system most people do i'm going to be outvoted and kicked off that island every day and i'm okay with that uh but if you're looking at it from the tier system perspective if that tv title or that lower card title scene starts to outshine me um it's it's time for me to to kick it in gear right because you should be motivated as champions uh whatever regardless of any tier system you should be motivated to be putting forth the best product on every program that you're involved in uh especially if it's surrounding your belt if it's surrounding a storyline if it's surrounding an angle whatever like your shit should you should want to steal the show uh, and and really set yourself apart uh, as far as you know that pecking order of champions, right? They, you, you, if it's one thing to be the you know a champion, but when you make your belt mean more than any other body's, you know, everybody else's belt, then you are the champion. No matter what where you're at on the card, John. Let me go over to you. No, I completely agree. I think that. Once you're in a championship position, your only job should be to make that the most prestigious belt in the company. And if you're not pulling that weight, then what are you doing with the belt? Someone else will be. And I promise you, if you are not making angles worth the title that you're wearing, someone will find a way to take it off of you and do something with it that you didn't figure out how to do for sure. Yeah, if I can chime in here. Um, so from a new perspective, that secondary title is that's the first uh, achievable goal that you're looking at because uh, a lot of times there's more than one secondary title. And when you get that belt, you can change what it means. The world title is the world title. It means you're representing the whole company. But with a secondary title, you get to define what your division means. So it, whether it's hardcore, a hardcore title or whether it's the pure title, you know, that is, uh, you know, uh, the, the one that has more tradition or the, the one that's more technical, submission style, um, or it could be a high flyer title, um, you get to kind of redefine uh, what that division is. So that's really exciting as someone who's new in a company to feel like they can make a permanent impact on, on the history of, of a trophy in that company. And, and, and I've been lucky enough to be able to do that. And to me, that 
that belt meant more to me than the world belt, right? I thought that more was being, I felt like I was doing more, telling a, a, a more specific story with that secondary title than with the than what was being done with the world title. And I think as a secondary champion, if you don't feel that way, you're not doing enough with that title. Like you need to set up, you know, make it unique and and sell that thing so that it does shine a little bit brighter than all the other secondary titles that are out there. Now Chris, the eighteen time champion, you've you have plenty of experience holding belts. Which are the ones that have meant the most to you? Ah, uh, the ones that I can remember. Uh, and, <laughs> and those are those are the, the the ones that have the best the best programs behind them. Like I remember my first, and I think everybody everybody remembers the first. Uh, I John cabled myself. Uh, this is, I've talked about this many times on other shows, and uh, when anyone ever talks about a championship uh, reign, well, I mean I can't because John's got me beat on this. Uh, they'd say, oh, it only went a week. I was like, well, I got you beat. I got, my first reign lasted not even 24 hours. Uh, I was green as goose shit in the game. I was terrible. I wasn't even Chris Page at the point. At this point, I was under a mask, and I was the Zen master. And this guy was like, I just want to, you know, I want to put the belt on you, but you're going to defend it in a month, and you're probably going to lose. He's like, but I, I, I appreciate the effort that you're putting in. Like, I was terrible. Um, and I was, he was like, I said, well, shit, if I'm just going to lose it, it, to me, it would be funny if, uh, you know, you did a house show the next day and I, and I dropped it on the house show back to him and he was like, ah, oh, that's great. We'll do that instead. So I cost myself a month, uh, a run, uh, with the world belt to fucking turn around and job it back to him. That one is the first and it's always the most memorable. Um. The, and there were are, were many along the ways, but like when I look at when I look back at the career, uh, I'll touch on uh, the program I had with MDK, uh, which most of you, the listeners won't know who that is, but um, we had some some really good shit uh, in 2009, 2010, um, really really good shit, uh, and and he ended my longest reign as world champion was right at a year. Uh, and he he ended it and uh the behind the curtain story is you know i exercised a rematch and i won it back a month later um uh, and that led to some real shit some behind the curtain shit and uh we ended up circling around and six years later and buried the hatchet uh and then worked together for another three or four years and uh but i always get back to that because that was the longest reign and how it ended and then getting it back and then i look at the the universal championship run john touched on it earlier uh whether people want to like it or not when you look at you know efed titles like that universal championship in the xwf is looked at as a possession and it's prized because it takes work to get there and it's not something that you're just gonna you know, pick up on your first match out and if you do fucking you did more than it, you know did better than i could um, it took me three tries, and over the course of my ten years, through, since 2009, 2010, three opportunities. It took the third opportunity to, to get the belt. And I ran with it for like four months, five months. Defended it seven times. Uh, every week, on every, just about every show. I was that guy. Uh, I, did, I called it a throwback run. If you can beat me for it, here, take it. Um, but I got to go up against everybody that was good, uh, you know, that was good in the Fed. Thad Dukes, I, I dropped it to Alias. Yeah, you know, if that gives anybody any indication, and then got stomped by him again in a rematch. So you know, it, it, it was he's the guy that, that that took it away. So I look at all those, and those are the memorable ones. I can think of you know, I'll throw a name out there that people aren't going to be familiar with. John will be Paul Frost. I, I did a world belt angle with him, uh, a story with him for several years, <clears throat> and I think he beat me for a belt, uh, for a world belt. If he didn't beat me for a world belt, he may have beat me for a, a mid-card belt. Um, I can remember going back to 2004. My my first uh, mid-card belt was an Intercontinental title uh, as Chris Page, and I ran with it for four or five months, and then the the Fed closed. 
uh, but I was on on track to to doing something uh, and and so forth and so on. Tag belts. I mean, I gotta think Dream of Maniacs. Like that was memorable. My run with uh, Robert Main and X Dub was was pretty fucking memorable. Like there's just a whole lot. There's I guess ultimately to to answer that question, I say all that to say like it all depends on what you are involved in and what you are invested in because I have also been in programs as champion that I wasn't so invested in. I tried to make the most of it and I would do what I could do, but it's it comes down to what you are personally more attached to and what's more personal to you in that situation regardless of of which championship it is. The ones that you can remember are the ones that that, that you're attached to. Absolutely. Which to me, that's why the that's why the WGWF world title is so important to me on this run. Because when I have had it, it slipped right through my fingers every time. And I've put so much work into the run that I've done in the WGWF over the course of however many years it's been that I've rarely won titles. Like, John won the inter- inter- Intercontinental title from Kyle Shane and what arguably is my most treasured win of any match ever. And outside of that, I think the, our Dream of Maniacs run uh, was really special just because how hot it was. And that wasn't even on John. That was on Sebastian. Um, and then... Uh, my PCW tag run with John and Sebastian was probably the next one for me. Uh, just because me and the Freebooters had a, a year and a half long angle that just ran. And it was so good. Yeah, I um, again, it's all on, I feel like, what what are you invested in? I, I can't. I can't tell you. I remember every single championship or every world championship that I held. I mean, I held one in one fed. I held their world belt like six times. So I I can't, you know, go back to say which one was more important than the other one. It's just I don't remember the six losses or the five losses that uh, MDK is the only one that I can remember um, that was like, yeah, that's the one. Um, And that was after dominating for like 14 months, 15 months. And he was the guy that stopped it. Um, but it's all, again, falls back on to, like, it is what you make it. I remember when I won that world belt for the first time in that particular fed, it was the WGWF, but it was before I ran it. It was being ran by somebody else. Um, there was not a lot happening. Like, when I say not a lot happening story-wise, there was a lot of matches that were put together, but they show segments. There was nothing there. There was, there was like a couple segments here, a couple segments there. So when I won that world belt, I started plugging the show. Like, I, this is 2004, 2005. I started like building my shit. 2006, maybe. Building story throughout the show. And whoever I was working with, I can remember as a champion, when you come in and you win the belt. And you have this storyline that's already, or not a storyline, but your next, your defense is against the guy that you just beat for the belt. It's the rematch, right? Uh, here's the worst thing that could ever happen to, to any champion. Uh, the guy's name was Famine of the Vile. He was unstoppable. He had been running there for five months and had picked up the belt and had ran with it for a couple of months. I came into the Fed and within two or two, two and a half months, kind of established that I was probably the next guy. Uh, so they put Famine and I opposite each other, and I picked up the belt. And we had a rematch that was going to be scheduled. And we're this is when we were doing shows. We'd have a pay-per-view every month. So we're we're two shows into a four-show run, and then you know that fourth show is your go-home to your pay-per-view. He backs out. So you've already invested two weeks of programming. So the worst thing that happens as a champion, uh, your your scheduled program walks. And now you're stuck in a position of you have two weeks. You have two shows to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. 
And I feel like it's those moments, because I can remember what I did. Uh, those moments make or break a champion because out of character. Because I could have easily put it on Barker and said, figure it out. I'm, I'm good to do whatever. Uh, logistically, at that time, the, that Fed hadn't popped yet. It was about to. It, we, it was on the cusp. So there wasn't a whole lot of people that were there that was going to compete uh, and be believable uh, at that point. So I took two. He was like, who, who can we do something with? I can do something with this guy and I can do something with this guy. We're going to make it a triple threat and here's how we're going to do it. I have two weeks to make this happen. I hit up, they hit up both those guys. They were okay. They were like, we're down. Let's do it. Uh, so we built a triple threat in two weeks and made that triple threat even though like logistically people didn't think that uh, they stood a chance we made them believe that they could defeat me and TV, the way we wrote TV was I put my, my character at that disadvantage and instead of it being a triple threat these guys were working together collectively uh, and then the story within the match itself one ended up turning on the other one and my character took advantage of of their uh breakdown because you know over the belt you know in character and in story but the the whole purpose is we took two weeks of tv and we made something uh that shouldn't have been anything and and made it believable to where these two guys could have one of them could have easily won the championship yeah i think that speaks a lot to the importance of booking your championships correctly the your fed heads have a huge responsibility in making sure that they are giving enough time to sell a match that they are <clears throat> that your champions are defending uh at a pace that is reasonable you don't want the the cha- the champion who's ducking everybody you don't want the part-time champion like like the Brock Lesnar or uh you know who are the who are the other guys that that never defend mm-hmm. it, that right. doesn't help your company um having a belt that's defended often is great having other belts that have a build into a match and a, and have a blow off that's great uh but it takes the the bookers to to make that happen uh, and while they're doing that they have to make sure that they give equal tv time to each one of those belts so your secondary title needs to be a main event uh title um, and you need to alternate between which cards are going to have your world title, your secondary title, your tag team titles, you know, as the main event. And, uh, and if you book that correctly, you can have a lot of pans in the fire at the same time. And I think if you look at, at a, pl- a place like um, AEW, they do a good job of rotating who's in the main events. Uh, I think... Look at a, I think it comes down, like you were talking about with the booking and the multiple title thing like that. I think since the world belt is often only booked like once a month or once every other month, that leaves the main event slot open for the secondary title, the tag titles to rotate in and out. And you also utilize your third and fourth angles uh, in your booking to pop those main events and give those guys push too. That's how you push the the second and third angles, even the fourth angles down. Uh, Cause, and, and that does come back to booking and how you, how you garnish worth and value in the titles that you're pushing because they get to ride those spotlights more often than not. Uh, but it also shows that people can get into the main event without a title. Uh, and that's important. Also, if you don't, build the third and fourth angles down then you don't have push in those guys to come up into the title scenes when they're done with the angles that they're running and i think successful companies keep that in mind and they structure their their card flow in a way that does rotate those the top title and the tag title and the secondary title and you've always got the tv title on all the shows to build that momentum into the main events. So as long as you build the structure, I think that's a good scheduling rule of thumb. And you can play with it a little bit and do what you want to do. 
but as far as booking goes, I think it's a good rule of thumb for Fed heads to keep that main event rotation angled onto uh, the titles, but not ignore that, that third and fourth angle. Yeah, if you look at the UFC, they do a great job of this, where they have all the different weight classes. Traditionally in boxing or MMA, the heavyweight title is, that's the big title, right? Um, but to only give the heavyweight title that uh, that platform, that exposure, would be a huge mistake on their part. So, so for UFC's, them, UFC's only giving the main events to the highest ticket sales. They don't give a shit about anything but money. Right, but they, they do a good job of making sure that each belt is defended uh, as a main event on one of their cards. Now, they have a different problem now where they've oversaturated the uh, the industry with too many events, uh, but they they do make a... They make sure that each one of their belts gets uh, gets TV time. Um, and this, and, and this kind of leads to my, my next, uh, thing that I wanted to bring up. And this is, this is a, a, uh, a criticism that I have. So I'm going to shoot a little bit on the, on the, on titles, but oh. I think that MMA and e-fetting in general has watered down the, the title picture and has oversaturated the market with too many titles where you've got dozens and dozens of people who are 20 time champions. And it's hard to tell, you know, how many of those championship wins actually mean something. But you read it, these bodies. It isn't hard to tell. Okay. Everybody that spends time in the industry and in the hobby knows what companies have been around for how long and knows what those belts mean. That's why, like, when I said, I was like, realistically, show me another world title that means more in the industry than the x -Dub. Now, I know at some point, the WGWF title was just as important in the industry because of the names that came through the locker room and who held that belt and how long they held it and how much effort was going in and the trust that those handlers got from the companies. And that's the big thing is, like, how much can the company trust someone to carry that title and really do it justice? And that's how you get belt shots, is being that guy that can be trusted to carry that belt and pull off whatever angle you need to pull to keep it. And it's important, especially in the competitive Fed, to show up all the time whenever you're supposed to and put the work in and be of the quality that the belt warrants. Unless you're arrested. I mean, unless you're arrested, then... You know, and I'm. Uh, then you, it's then, not then, just then, you. Then you get cashed in on, and you lose the championship. When you I mean, it's not just you. On a holiday weekend. It's it's not just you. It's happened to some of us. I won't say all of us, but some of us. So how do you but know? It, how do you know when you have too many titles or too many title matches in your federation? Because you've seen some of these feds that have. It seems like everybody is in contention for a title at the same time you know you got 20 people in the fed you got 10 titles it's like how many you know everybody is a contender uh which i don't think is necessarily a good thing how do you know when you have enough titles to spread around well i'll speak on my behalf um i'm a firm believer less is more uh i feel like you know the 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 fewer championships you have the more valuable they are uh, the more people want to, want to hold them, um, because it's you're you're not gonna get a crack at them every show or every other show. <clears throat> That's not to say that you know having more 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 titles or more championships is a bad thing. That's just I me. Mean, it's to me per it's a personal thing. I'm not gonna. I, we don't do that. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, because again, I think that less is more, and it gives more value to who holds a championship. You know, you've got the world belt, you're gonna have the intercontinental belt, you're gonna have the TV belt, and uh, you're gonna have tag belts. So that's more than enough. Uh, and 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 it, to be honest with you, it may be one too many. Uh, if if I'm being perfectly fair, but if, if I think I think it's like I think for me, one per ten roster slots plus the tag titles is a good number. Yeah. And I know that that doesn't always work out well or whatever, but um, it, you know, I don't, I don't know. It it could be good at one to ten. I think that's a good balance number. 
I would say maybe like for every eight, so that you could reasonably put together a tournament for for each title. Um, you know, eight people in contention for a title. I th- think that sounds reasonable. But Chris, let me ask you this: um, I personally am a proponent of having more divisions in in a Fed rather than lumping everybody together in the same pool. And I know this is kind of a controversial topic, but for instance, uh, I think having a women's division and having a cruiserweight or a, a lightweight division uh, is not a bad idea because it kind of gives people a niche for their their character style. If they want to create a high flyer, they probably want to have a high flyer match. If if they want to create a female wrestler, they probably want to wrestle other female wrestlers. And personally, for me, that's what I like to see, where it's a fair matchup. I don't ne- I don't want to see someone who's 115 pounds against a guy who's 300 pounds, and then have to pretend like no, this is a fair match. This is uh, everybody's got a, a chance here. Um, so, Chris, let me get your opinion on that because I understand that. I don't know. I want to be careful about about how I describe that because I've that was one of the things that surprised me when I came back to the hobby. Um, you kind of lost me. So give me a give me a cliff note again. What what's the question? Give it to me one more time. The question is, how do you feel about having a a a lightweight wrestler? Ah, okay, gotcha. uh, male right. or female versus a 300 pounder and having them all in the same division versus right. having separate divisions for weight classes or for genders does so, what are your thoughts on that we'll start with the weight classes first so you can do that if you have the roster that it that is that's that's garnered to that so let's say you've got the light heavyweight division that you're trying to do at 220 pounds well, how many people in your roster do you have at 220 pounds or less? Do you and how many how many people that are coming in with their bios are at that or under that weight class, right? So if you have enough talent to justify it, then absolutely fucking do it. it I mean that's that's cool, uh, but you also that shit comes in waves. Uh, On a flip side of that, how many times have you watched Ray Ray? fight the giant or diesel and have blockbuster matches i was going there but hold on hold on that's that's the second piece of that um that's when you're setting up your weight classes or your 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 class belts women's sit divisions the same way i'm personally one that doesn't that i don't care if you want to if you're a female talent and a female handler character and you want to wrestle with other females that's fine if you want to wrestle intergender, that's fine. Because in society today, uh, there is intergender wrestling. It's out there. It's It happens. So how do you write that match? And how do you make that match believable? Well, that's where you as the match writer, and this is where I have to agree with John, as the match writer, you can dictate that pace. So if I have a 300-pound guy and I've got a 120-pound guy, and it's role played out, and the 120 pound guy's going over. Now it's my job as a writer to challenge myself to figure out how to do that. And the easy way to get around it is obviously uh, you've got David versus Goliath, right? And, and you've got speed and quickness versus uh, uh, power and, 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 and brawn and girth or what have you. So you find a way to make that critical mistake with your monster. That that leads to the the the, the victory uh, for the smaller the smaller talent. It's clearly not going to be written uh, as a competitive style match because reality is reality. Three hundred pounds trumps one hundred twenty pounds any day of the fucking week. And as a character, you should know going into that match that if you do come out with the W you're probably going to get a shellacking most of the match because that's just how in the real world it would be. But you do have your hope spots and you do have your moments and you have your Ray Ray moments and you have those those situations that can arise during a match. It's up to us as a match writer to get creative with that to get to that end result. To be fair, 
in real life, I would much rather fight a 450 pound dude than a 125 pound dude, given all skills are relevant. Why? Because that big guy, once I get him on the ground, he's going to have a lot harder time getting up. That little dude is going to climb me like a mountain and pound my face in before I can grab him. I'll be all over so, you like a goddamn spider monkey. Exactly. I would much rather fight a larger opponent than a smaller one all day. And in all of the fights I've ever had, a small guy has been more terrifying in a ring than a big guy every day of the week. So my opinion on, on this topic is skewed because I used to, in real life, teach MMA – and uh, I trained jujitsu for six years, and I can tell you that uh, all things are not equal uh, when when it comes to uh, size, right? So you know, the the old adage is that if size mattered, then the elephant would be the king of the jungle, not the, not the lion. But if you roll with a guy who's twice your size, he's gonna lay on you and wear you out. If you if roll you let with him. One, you you don't have a choice. That's not you, true. You don't have a you choice. You must use speed as your advantage. If you I'm, have to stay I, away from I, a guy to get the win, then that's what you do. I, I'm telling ring, you that smaller technique... people, chicks versus dudes, big guy, little guy, whatever it is, the little guy can use speed as the advantage. You I, just I, have to stay away from that first big hit. So that's I understand <laughs> that speed kills, right? And I saw UFC, the, the first couple UFC cards where you had smaller guys win those fights. But my personal experience has been that size makes a difference and that it is really difficult to train technique with people who are drastically different sizes because it just resorts back to brute strength. And it's not particularly fun to watch. It's We used to call it wrestle-fucking each other, is that one person would lay on the other while the smaller individual would look for an opening and while that spectacle is great, where once in a while you have, you know, Rey Mysterio beat the giant, um, that needs to be a rare occurrence so that it has that much more power. Uh, when that is every week and that's your division where you've got mismatches every week, it, you lo it becomes more difficult to suspend disbelief and, and agree that, yeah, no, this is a fair division. Um, in the UFC, you're not going to see a featherweight fight uh, a heavyweight. Oh, it that would featherweight be... would rock their day, dude. You'd no, be surprised. There's... I'm telling you, there's no way in hell. There's a massive difference, <laughs> even 20 pounds difference. Well, and it's the difference between versus... MMA and wrestling, too, because in wrestling, I can stand on your knee and wrench your leg off. No, you're right. You're I right. can't there, do that in a UFC ring. So when you're looking at e fetting and wrestling and you're talking about the size discrepancies and how divisions and, and belt structures work, realistically, like those little guys have opportunities to do lots more damage than they would in a UFC fight. Or, you know, because of the rule structures. And really, realistically, wrestling is far if it were real, the things that wrestlers do in a ring, we would kill each other on a weekly basis. Sure. Like, just absolutely annihilate each other. UFC guys would never come to wrestling rings. Ever. Because getting waffled in the head with a chair on a regular basis, that shit does damage. I got lumps. Like, I realistically, I like lumps. Sure, sure. But that's not supposed to happen, right? They're, we're su supposed to suspend disbelief and keep kayfabe alive. And there's supposed to be an element of realism to this where we go, <laughs> no, this could actually happen. And when you've and i think having intergender matches is is kind of like okay once in a while it makes sense but to do it every week to me and this is just my opinion it's uh it's not i don't have a taste for it right well and I, I think I wanna, like page said it comes, every week i think like page said it comes down to the match writing if the match writing is believable then it doesn't really matter if it's every week if you always right. write a good believable match for it then run whatever so as a match writer is it more difficult to write an intergender match or uh you know a, a lightweight versus a super heavyweight i think the answer has got to be yeah it is more difficult because you can't fall back on basic wrestling now all of a sudden it's got to be 
this David versus Goliath scenario. I've, um, I've been writing matches for 20 fucking years. I can write anything. Yeah. And I, and I, I mean, I say or in, that. In with, your with, opinion, with, in the longevity that you've been writing matches, do you find it more interesting to write those kinds of matches than, like, me and Bam punching the shit out of each other? I like being challenged uh, to a degree. And I do think that it, while it can be viewed as being more difficult, I would call it trying to be more creative because you've got to think, uh, you've got to think real, real life shit versus how would like, this person get their spot in versus right. this person get and, their spots in. And then the other piece of it too is, is circling around on the bios, right? Like with your younger, or you got your younger, with your smaller talent versus your long, your, your larger talent having to, to figure out ways to work a move set in and and sometimes it's just not feasibly possible with the moves that are listed on a bio versus what could realistically be done to this larger talent so that's where as a handler you have to understand that the match writer they're going to take liberties because we got to figure out uh, you may you may see something in the match that is not in your move set that allows you to get an advantage to something in your move set, but it's all about what can be viable. Yeah, um, Buster Gloves is not going to figure four leg lock Bray Wyatt in the middle of the ring and have any kind of success like that. Why not? That's <laughs> dude. <laughs> get your leg, get your little legs around those tree trunks, and you tell me about it. <laughs> so I, I have a great example of what you're talking about, Chris. In the World Series of Wrestling. My job was to judge profiles, and we had a very lightweight character whose finishing move was a running powerbomb. And you put that character in a ring against uh, John Cable, and they're not pulling off a running powerbomb. So yeah, John's I went, almost 300 I, pounds. Right, so I reached out to this handler and said, hey, just so you know, you may want to come up with a different finisher because it doesn't seem realistic. And they said, well, actually, my character is in SCW, which has a knockouts division uh, or bomb bombshells division. Yeah. Is that Sin City Wrestling or yep. Supreme Championship Wrestling? Um, and they said in that division, you know, I run that all the time and I've won titles with that match. And I said, you know what? When you explain it that way, it makes a lot of sense. Put that in your bio to give it context because it makes sense that way. But in an open weight division, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And uh, I would think that John, as someone who's who's has a uh, close to 300 pound character, if you were going to lose to a lightweight character and you're expected to put them over, uh, it's got to burn your ass when they say, "Oh, you know, little old me beat you know, hit this guy with a power bomb." It, it's kind of that it's comes. Burn that's you that's up. all on the match writer. And I know that there have been plenty of times when I've gone to Paige after a show and been like, "Hey." In this match, this thing went down, and that just seemed off. Yep. Like, this this one thing about it just seemed off, and it kind of soured that whole match. Yes. So, yep. you know, just FYI, I noticed, I don't know if anybody else is going to tell you about it, but I saw this thing, and it you was like... Mis eh. You felt misrepresented in the match. Well, I was, it wasn't even about me, necessarily. I always, like, my, my moveset is so big... Like, John's moveset legitimately is a page and a half long, um, which represents his training that he's gone through in different companies and different places for the stuff that he's trained. And, and you saw that in his bio about the things that he's done specifically to alter the fighting style that he uses. Um, but my moveset is so big that there's plenty of material for people to use, and it covers the spectrum of everything. So they have plenty of material to use. And I love seeing other rosters that have that same kind of thing. And I know like some people look at it and they're like, Jesus, what'd you do? Just go through the wrestling move Bible? Yes. Yes, I did. That's why it's an alphabetical order. And I selected them specifically because of they, they would be a move set that John in his size and his capacity would utilize as a full fledged move set for the character. I don't know right. that a lot of people always go into that when they're building characters, but it's also easier to utilize characters that do that for better matches. So, so, so go what, figure. What you're saying is, and let me interrupt for a second. What you're saying is you spent a lot of time putting, a, putting together a moveset that made a lot of sense 
for your character. Now, if John taps out to an abdominal stretch from a hundred pound uh, uh, wrestler, <laughs> if would feel in like the course of that, that match, doesn't... if in the course of that match the wrestler's move set would reflect that they would be using that as a finisher and did work on my abs and my back and my spine, then it would make sense in the end of the match if that were the case because they would be focused on that spot. And that, again, comes down to the match writer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so context matters. Absolutely. Especially in move sets and finishes. So the argument... The argument I'm making is that by creating these divisions, these weight classes and these uh, men, male and female divisions, you don't have to worry about getting the match writers to provide the context quite as often. You know, it just you kind of take away that risk of misrepresenting and, and offending a handler because it wasn't written correctly. So I'm trying to bring this full circle to titles and divisions and just some of the thought process that bedheads might want to think about before setting up uh, the, their title divisions. Because from, at least from my perspective, which if I think it, at least somebody else probably feels the same way about it, it could be problematic if it's not handled well and if you don't have really good match writers. Chris, I, I, well, I cut both you guys off there, so... No, no, no. I, I mean, it all, context is key, and it all comes down to. It. I see where you're going with it on as far as the match writer side. I also know where John's coming from on context side. I think that it's if you have the rosters that warrant the space and warrant that that breakdown, then you do that. If you don't, then you don't. Uh, but it is up to the match writer to ultimately make that decision and make that call. Uh, to keep everything viable and believable. So, do I? Th you're if you're going back to the John situation where an abdominal stretch is probably the possible finish. Well, no, I don't see that happening because I I don't see that much damage being done in the course of a contest unless it's some sort of like gimmick match or something like that, which would then open up the possibility. Um, I think that finishes in that situation are more, uh, you know, catch them off guard. You know, those are your well, roll in, ups in that particular school. example, in that particular example, if I come off the corner to the outside onto somebody that's laid up on the railing and they move and I take a rib cage to the railing at some point in the match, and then I get, you know, a drop kick to the guts while I'm laid up in the corner in a tree of woe. Or, you know, if there's continuous effort to target a space and then the match finish comes off believable, then that works. But it all does come down to the writer and figuring out what kind of context they, they want to use. And I'm sure that it is easier when you have, you know, all 250-pound guys running around doing the same thing, obviously. Then, but then the difficulty becomes, how do I make this character stand out against this character or stand out against the rest of the roster? So having those matches of those different weight classes and the different divisions, I really think is a way to, to add variety to the match styles to keep the results interesting. Don't you, Sauce? Well, uh, I, I know that we need to wrap things up here, but I wanted to open one more can of worms if you okay. guys are game for it. Yeah, I got one more. Uh, all right, so I'm going to shoot pretty hard here. Uh -oh. So make sure you're sitting down for a minute. Um, I think that tag team titles are garbage. Oh. Right? right, and I'm not the only one who feels this way. And oh. uh, in in real life wrestling, I don't think that way at all. I think they they're probably the most exciting belts to have. And they speak more to traditional wrestling than anything else. But in e fetting, I don't think anyone wants to be in the tag division. I think it's a consolation prize. Because I think everybody's some people, greedy. Yes. Some people are offended by it. Everybody wants the individual spotlight. They don't want to be in a tag team. And they may fake being interested long enough to be in a tag team tournament because they want to step in and get that title match. 
but they don't want a long-term run in a tag team division. They want individual accomplishments. Then they don't really have a good tag team partner that they love and care about. Well, if they do, their partner doesn't love and care about them as much. Yes, they do, damn it. <laughs> it's possible. So I, I think it is possible. You probably have one good tag team in every Fed. And beyond that, uh, and they're probably the ones holding the belts. Beyond that, nobody else wants it. Uh, I know for a a fact there's a fed and i don't know if i want to name drop who it is but the the title um the guys who had the title can't find any challengers they've beaten everybody there's nothing left so they're trying to bring in people from outside the company who will come in and they'll get jobbed out and they'll keep the streak going and the division's dead i've seen tag team divisions dead in four or five different feds and i think it's because this game is not built for long-term tag team runs. Um, I know you guys disagree, so I want to hear your take on it. For a long time, I ran two characters so that I could have a tag team and wrote for both of them. See, that's the problem. that's what I wanted. See, that's still you getting all the individual spotlight. It's not you and another handler running a tag team. Well, and I think that the workload for two characters is a lot, just, is, just in general, is a lot. Like having a 2,000 word cap and having two of them every time is 4,000 words. Sure. Um, but also on the other end, Paige and I have run long-term tag angles and love doing it and have a great time. I know that he enjoys writing with me and I enjoy writing with him. And when you find a tag partner that you like to write with and you have good character interaction and you build those long-term story angles, I mean, they're really good. We've had the... The Glorious New Breed has been an off and on again, like threes company roller coaster. It's been insane. And we've been against each other more times than we've been in the ring together as a tag team, I think. So here's a fun fact uh, with me any tag title that I've ever held, and I've held many. You know, when I say 18, that's 18 world belts. That's, that's not, not miscellaneous and undercard championships. Those are, those, are the, those are the Magnatics. Uh, any tag title that I've ever held, I've held with somebody else. I've collabed on, and I've ran. It, it, we've worked together. If it's been two pieces, I've done one, they've done one. Now, as, as time has evolved, and the game has evolved, and word docs became a thing, and, and being able to go in and collectively write simultaneously... Uh, yeah, Google has, Docs is a heaven sin. It's become like the thing. Um, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy writing with someone else. And I have been on the side of being in a long-term uh, tag title run several times with the with the, the, uh, the Glorious New Breed and the Dreamy Maniacs back in the day. Dreamy Maniacs ran for 182 days as champs. Um up through my, my my one of my last long term tag title runs was with Robert Maine and XWF and that was for ten months. Uh, but in that second run or that last run with Maine, like you could tell that nobody really wanted to play. And you know why would they? Because Robert was like a a dominating and polarizing force there all on his own, and then you incorporate me into that mix that. You know, I wasn't as good as Robert, but I was fucking close. I was uh, you know, close enough to make people shit their pants. And you put us together, working in a dock together. I have the most fun there, even if <clears throat> there's not like 19 people to to step up and challenge me or step up and challenge us, uh, as as it would be. I've never been able to do a tag team by myself. Uh, at any time, I just think that you know it should be noted that uh, it's not necessarily about uh, how many teams that you have it's really about the writing of the teams that you do have and are they writing singularly or are they writing together because to me the whole purpose of being a tag champion is working collectively and collaborating hence the word team uh, <clears throat> doesn't mean that one handler can't handle a team uh, because you absolutely can um, I think that it, it's more gar it should be more garnered towards two different handlers collaborating and forming that team dynamic and getting out there and doing it together. But again, 
you know, there are some some hell of a tag teams out there that are handled by one person. The Ramseys come to mind right off rip. Todrick and uh, and Austin Ramsey. Um, I want to say that uh, there's a, there's a team in IIW, the Celtic Club, uh, that's handled by one person. Uh, Fred Debonair. Fabulous. Fred Debonair. Fabulous Freebooters and PCW was handled by one person, and we ran a year and a half long angle together, and it was amazing. So it's all it's all it's all ultimately open to interpretation, open into the Fed's interpretation, and again, how are the belts booked? Any belt, if you think a belt's trash, and that's your opinion, and you're it's you're entitled to that opinion, but it's probably because the belt's been booked like trash, and if it's been booked like trash, then why would you give it a second thought or why would a, a, a handler coming into the fed be like hey, why would i want to do that you know it's all about how you represent it and again can people get behind it and, and are they buying what you're selling and and can you as the champion i would take it as a challenge personally again you think this is trash <laughs> let me go ahead and get that and and let's I don't have to shop here for challengers. I'm I'm lucky enough to have a, a name recognizable that I could go out and find somebody else and find other people to come in and challenge us for these belts. You don't you think they're trash? Let me show you something. I'm that guy. I would take it as a challenge. Uh, mission mission accepted. Is is kind of my view. So let me ask you this: You just reopened WGWF. How many people are on the roster? 22, 23. How many tag teams do you have? One. Two, exactly. Three, three, three. You have three. So the question is, do you really need a tag team belt? Not right now, and it's not that's that's not in the equation right now. But tag, right, so tag team wrestling is. So a lot of people could make the argument that tag team matches are really good for continuing. Uh, storylines without while protecting everybody that's involved in those storylines and I believe that's how tag teams and trios should be used uh, as you're experimenting you're having these uh, matchups you know these odd couples of people who don't get along or all of a sudden partners or you have people who are you know uh, two champions on the same team uh, against two challengers uh, you know, for the pay-per-view, you know, you have all these unique things you can do to build up to big singles matches, but you don't necessarily need those tag team titles. Um, so I think that a lot of feds think that they have to have them when they, they don't. If you've got two tag teams, why do you have belts? Are they just going to fight each other every pay-per-view? I did it. <laughs> no, and I think that you have people that will interchange uh, I mean, ideally, you want to, to as a fed head, whether you have the teams or you don't, you want to push the, the notion of being able to collaborate and work with somebody and have something there. It's almost like breaking stuff down into divisions. Uh, if you have the roster cap that are, are under 220 pounds and you have enough to do a junior heavyweight or a cruiserweight division, then you do that because you give those people something to work for and something to work at. Um, and I think that if utilized correctly, regardless of how many teams you have, you got the opportunity to make a, a quote unquote division out of it. Uh, and yeah, it can be looked at as from your perspective as well. Like it should, you can use it as a way to tell other stories without belts being involved. But ultimately, I think it falls on. In case in point, Sin City Wrestling doesn't have tag team champions. They don't. They don't have the. They don't have the representation. Uh, but I'm over there working an angle with Goth, and we've resurrected them. We're gonna be, you know what I mean? Like we're gonna be calling ourselves the Sin City Tag Team Champions, and Sin City's not even gonna recognize it, but we are. <laughs> you know, so it's like, well, it you can have fun with it, and not yeah. even again. It's just uh, you don't you don't think this is cool, or you know, okay, let me let me get that. Let me show you. Let me show that's, you something. That's a great gimmick, right? That's a great storyline. Well, and a lot of times that that ends up being what the tag team division is, is usually just a small handful of tag teams, maybe two or three teams that are keeping a whole division interesting. And as long as those teams are doing that, 
then the division is not worthless because you're still telling stories the way you want to tell them and you have teams that are interacting. Um, tag teams also, you know, spawn faction events and things like that. So they're, they're again, good story hooks and things like that. So they have a place. Um, whether you have enough people for titles or not is, is a questionable. And like I said, with the Freebooters and I, when we were doing our angle, we were the only two real tag teams in the PCW at the time. But it was, the stories that we were telling were interesting enough that everyone was interested in what we were doing long enough that we ran a tag angle about the belts for a year. And there were sporadic other teams even involved in the scene. But we had enough story content and were telling an interesting enough story that people were looking at it. So it was worthwhile being there. And as long as you have teams that are telling good stories, then why not have a division for it? I don't even know where to go next, gentlemen. I, 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 I think we've covered all the I think we've covered all the important parts. The the meanings of the titles, what the purposes are. Uh, you know, generally how many belts you should have per roster number. You know, I don't think that I don't think that you should really I don't think that you should push outside of the ten per slot because then at least there's enough people competing for each belt uh, that you can maintain angles and have secondary storylines running in the background around those titles. Um, and like we're WGWF is in an interesting place because we just reopened. And everyone has an equal opportunity to tell a story. So it's really up to you. And I guess it's that way even in long-running feds to find your niche, open it up, and work your way into an angle to get yourself in the conversation for a title belt. And once you get yourself in the conversation, you have to decide what you do with it. And then it's up to you to make the belts important. Amen. Yeah, I don't think you could say it any better than that. Uh, I, I go back to and will always fall back on. It's the belt doesn't make uh, the handler. The handler makes the belt, <clears throat> and it's just one of those one of those deals. I enjoy the uh, the the back and forth on this one because it's I think it's been very insightful uh, from having three different perspectives from three different. Uh, uh, ten years in the game is 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 interesting. Uh, applesauce, I'm not a fan that you think tag team <laughs> role playing's trash. Not a, not a fan. So so let me give you my final thought, and then you can yep. kick me off the show. Yep. Uh, my final thought is less tag teams, <clears throat> uh, more stables, and never trios. Uh, says says the sauce boss. You can <laughs> you can quote me on that. Um, well, I'm more inclined to uh, to say that this has been another good program. Uh, this is you, you came up with an award winning idea for for this show, and uh, actually, I think you've you've got the topics for the next couple of shows. Um, so, needless to say, this has been uh, it's been good, John. What uh, what do you what would you like to say to our to our you know our our, our sexy listeners out there? Uh, as we close this out well as per usual i'm very glad that every one of you are here with us to enjoy this topic tonight i hope that you guys have at least entertained the ideas that we've presented and uh and we've presented them in a way that is both informative and educational and entertaining for everyone out there uh, don't forget if you did like this content to click the buttons down below that like and subscribe bell Make sure you set all the notifications to hear all of the wonderful content here at CCPE Productions and Ringbell Radio. I know that it has been a pleasure for me to knock another one of these down in the books. It's been a great one, and I've been glad to be here. Well, as uh, you said, this is always the CCPE Podcasting Productions. On behalf of John and the glorious Mandingo Man Beast and the Soft Boss, uh, I'm Hayler.